Hello, I'm Stephanie Jo Kent, a white woman with very short gray hair and glasses. I'm wearing an orange jacket with white flowers over a white collared shirt. Thank you for having me back at the GEMEL conference. I'm happy to recognize many of you from last year. It's very exciting for me and my co-authors, Jeff Shaw, Catherine Lancer, and Jeff Kappen, to follow the opening keynote and roundtable about AI. Let's dive in. There are three main parts to this talk about language and time. Sometimes I visualize them as a double helix, like DNA, coiling around each other in ways that are very hard to tease apart, carrying genetic information from the past to the future. If you feel I'm drifting, remember that in my mind, I'm sticking very close to this dual object of study, temporality and languaging. Theoretically, I'm asking, what are the temporal effects of languages and languaging on the organization of culture? Practically, I'm asking, what are the temporal effects of languages and languaging on the culture of organizing for business purposes. This is an existential matter as business and society grapple with the possibilities and risks of generative AI. Now, here's your prompt. How are language sensitive researchers related to the language industry? The language industry has been developed mainly by translators working in localization. Localization is marketing, mostly, and sometimes customer service in the local languages of geographic places where companies do business. Localization experts work every day in what I call the condition of language difference. Translation service providers, TSPs, and language service providers LSPs within the language industry are big and growing. Here's some numbers from a 2024 market report on the language industry from a private research firm, NIMSI. They project a 7% compound annual growth rate for the next five years. At that rate, by 2030, this will be a $100 billion industry. In terms of trends, NIMSI reports that half, 49.9% of revenues in 2023, are from clients based in North America. This is an increase up from 41% in the previous year, confirming that the U.S. is the biggest market for language services. In that same one-year time period, there was a decline of 10% in revenues in Europe, from 48.2% in 2022 to 38.5% in 2023. Currently, the language industry is not feeling threatened by generative AI. Instead, they're looking to leverage it. Top companies in the language industry are recalibrating their workforce strategies, aiming to optimize operational efficiencies in the shifting landscape of technological advancements. Top companies seek to leverage Gen AI either to support, expand, or improve existing workflows, including optimizing language management system platforms. In some cases, they are upgrading by replacing older tech. What's really driving overall growth, though, is the interpreting sector. Because demands for interpreting rely less on economic factors and more on geopolitics, such as war and immigration and on regulation in key verticals in the U.S. and the EU, such as health care. For the purposes of this presentation, reporting on trends in the language industry presents a discourse about social practices. That is, a discourse about social practices regarding communication within the condition of language difference. Say it again. For the purposes of this presentation, reporting on trends in the language industry presents a discourse about social practices regarding communication within the condition of language difference. 
The language industry is talking a lot about languages and AI, of course, and also broader concerns. This is the April cover of the premier magazine of the language industry. It combines scholarship, op-eds, and journalistic style reporting with general enthusiastic cheerleading. The theme of this issue puts language companies' behavior into conversation with global problems. This is not an outlier. As we just learned, migration is on scale with war as a geopolitical stimulus for language services due to the heightened need for accurate communication when in crisis. They did a survey, multilingual magazine, and according to their preliminary survey results, 78%, more than three-fourths of the people who work every day within the condition of language difference, believe that it is important to prioritize sustainability. The previous chart showed providers' beliefs, but you may wonder, do customers care? Now, these results here are perceptions, not actual responses from the customers themselves. Still, 68% of the respondents, over two-thirds, believe that customers of the language industry are paying attention to what companies do. Oh, well, you may ask, so what? Well, who is actually going to do the things required to meet the growing crises? Respondents generally prioritize the role of business and government working together. The majority expect the rest of us to do our part, too. I suggest that our part includes our work roles, not only our home life and other activities beyond the job. And so I ask, might there be synergy between internal company language policies and external localization? This is not rhetorical. As I mentioned above, the motivation is theoretical, practical, and existential. My co-authors and I speculate about this in a chapter on teaching about the role of languages in sustainable business. In addition to describing several classroom activities, we introduce some technical terminology about AI and socio-technical systems. Okay, on to section two. Remember that we're talking about language and time, specifically the interrelation of language with time. A Russian literary theorist, Mikhail Bakhtin, identified chronotopes when he compared written languages across millennia. Technically translated as time space, Bakhtin put time first to signify its influence on human social organization. Within the ways we write, he argued, language orients us to time. And time comes to take the shape we give it. A Bakhtin scholar described this relation between language and time space as calibration. So, here we are. In December 2022, language seemingly ceased to be a uniquely human trait. Large language models in Gen AI suggest that we will soon have automatic interpreting by artificial intelligence. Star Trek, here we come. My degree is in the discipline of communication, which developed in an interdisciplinary way, a transdisciplinary way, merging elements of anthropology and sociology with early studies of mass media and information science roughly a century ago. It's a new discipline compared with, for instance, linguistics. I already mentioned chronotopes and calibration, which theorize the relation of language to social change happening over long periods of time and across timescales to encompass every facet of society. The idea that communication itself has dimensionality akin, shall we say, to gravity, blows my mind. 
In my studies, I also learned James Carey's definition of communication, that it is always happening simultaneously in space and in time. In space, through the exchange of information, and in time, by constituting the quality of our relationships with each other. For instance, will we become colleagues, comrades, or merely acquaintances? No enemies, please. The significance of the temporal dimension of communication is demonstrated by Norman Fairclough's three-dimensional theory of critical discourse analysis, which poses language uses behavior in which every utterance is simultaneously an act, an instance of discursive practice, or an instance of discourse, and an instance of social practice, or we could say culture. Typically, researchers choose one layer or lens and stick with it for all kinds of reasons. But that selection doesn't mean that the other layers are gone. It just means they're no longer in the forefront. They become hidden or even repressed. Kenneth Burke described this language behavior as a terministic screen. Focusing on only one layer in any given study produces an artificial separation as if the layers are discrete and disconnected from each other. However, in reality, these layers are nested within each other. They shift in prominence depending upon the researcher's perspective. We can argue about relevance, whether the levels are stratified and to what degree, if they're contingent upon each other, but they all three exist at the same time, always. In 2009, Streak and Jordan showed us what they call nested timescales in the minute behaviors and language of a car salesperson during every moment of a sales pitch from first encounter to closing the deal. These concepts about time and language, as well as others, allowed me to begin trying to make sense of what I have observed and experienced about communication in the condition of language difference. I've categorized the evidence as fields of language action because I'm comparing and contrasting instances of speech acts in combination with discourses about them and the social practices that the act and discourse are embedded within. Again, all five fields involve the condition of language difference. The condition of language difference is characterized by tensions of languaging, by which I mean A, the degree of similarity and distinction in the languages used, studied, or talked about by people acting in each field, and B, the attitudes people express about the degree of similarity or distinctiveness of languages, including their modalities, such as sign languages or spoken languages, or mediums, such as face-to-face, -face, through text or email, in a conference call, or a hybrid meeting. Finally, the energy of those tensions pull or push the way people interact. These are the calibrations to the longer time scale of social practice and chronotopes. If the pull of domestication is strongest, this draws an organization inward to homolingualism, centered around using the same language. Alternatively, if the push of foreignization in language use is allowed to draw upon people's differences in creativity, this stretches the organization toward plurilingualism. So how do we work with the tension between domestication and foreignization? This is a problematic because communication doesn't have a static solution. Instead, communication is a polarity that needs to be continuously solved and resolved. A pervasive theme about the condition of language difference is what seems to me a conflation between language and communication. Language, especially the phrase, the same language, is often used in such a way to imply that no communication is possible without it, without us having the same language. 
how do we disentangle this knot in order to use language and communication to organize within the condition of language difference? So we're now in the third and final section of this talk. Here are the five cases, the five fields of language action. For the last year, I've been volunteering with two advocacy groups about the impact of generative AI on the profession of interpreting. This led me to looking more closely at the language industry, described earlier, which now brings me full circle back to how I was drawn into all of this to begin with through my work as a professional interpreter. If you're interested, there's a 14-minute video summarizing time-space linkages between sign language interpreting and spoken language interpreting that I gave at a language industry conference called Interpret America. The model for being a good interpreter was created at the World War II War Crimes Tribunal at Nuremberg. The demeanor and performance criteria that conference interpreters now follow at the European Parliament and around the world was created within extraordinarily traumatic circumstances. When sign language interpreters started modeling their professional conduct in this vein, deaf communities pushed back against the depersonalization and even dehumanization of what they called the machine model, a hands-off, here's the information and you're on your own style that was in total contradiction to normal humane communication. The fascinating thing that took me years to figure out is that the most foreignizing part of interpreted interaction isn't the language per se. It's the turn-taking. It's the way the rhythm of your orientation to time is thrown off by the intermediation of an interpreter. Okay, it may seem like we've taken a long way around to get here. The point is that the development of Gen AI for interpreting can either continue or disrupt the discourse tensions that are evident in fields of language action. Remember that the tensions are, one, the pull of domestication, which we all like, and two, the push of foreignization that we might like, but it's hard work. <laughs> the path to the Star Trek horizon of a universal translator is rough. The quality of language data available for machine learning varies tremendously, depending upon how much text of those languages already exists on the web. Of those languages that are represented on the internet, Thompson et al. discovered a selection bias in sentences that satisfy multi-way parallelism, meaning they can be effectively translated across three languages maintaining the same meaning. These are all simple, easy sentences that are short and predictable. Thompson's team also discovered that much of the available text on the internet in low resource languages are bad machine translations of English, rather than original content from native language users. Both of these trends build bias into the algorithms. Multi-way parallelism is cutting edge, it formulates embeddings among and across many different language combinations using, among other things, a technique called distance-based mining. The distance-based mining approach leverages massive multilingual sentence embeddings and a margin-based criterion to mine parallel sentences. The core idea is to learn a multilingual sentence embedding, or an embedding space in which semantically similar sentences are close, independent of the language they are written in. This means that distance in the embedding space can be used to determine if two sentences are mutual translations or not. The most important word in this explanation is embedding. Once something is embedded, it is fixed, permanent, established. This may seem like a good thing, and I'm not arguing that we don't need stable reference points. Of course we do. 
However, my current understanding is that these translation technologies privilege, meaning they are biased toward, sentences with a verifiable, identical meaning in other languages. Which leads me to wonder what is happening with the other sentences that contain variations in meanings and or culturally specific knowledge and intelligence. If you ask me, I'm thinking this seems like the translation technique of domestication. Domestication comes from a translation theorist, Venuti. A domesticated translation removes and hides aspects of cultural difference so that readers can absorb the information or story from within their own familiar cultural framework. For example, by employing familiar terminology and explications of context and even relocating the physical settings. Something like parallel embedding is how translation works in the EU. The European Commission works closely with the members of the European Parliament to ensure that laws are written according to the phrases that have already been approved for translation into all the languages. It's counterintuitive, but I arrived to the concept of homolingualism because of the way languages are handled by the most multilingual institution in the world. Later, I learned of the related concept of homolingual address, which describes a power move used by authorities in Japan to force language standardization upon the population by talking to them only in the chosen dialect and assuming that it was understood. <clears throat> anyway, in the Parliament, since at least 2004, MEPs are discouraged from oratory that showcases the unique attributes of their languages. No poetry, no pithy quotations, heaven forbid slang or idioms. Yes, of course, such speech acts are challenging to interpret, but this is really only a problem under expectations of domestication when the desire is to prevent or suppress the performance of difference. The antidote to domestication is foreignization. But how do we move this concept from the realm of translation into everyday working life? Foreignization refers to those aspects of a translated work that retain elements of the original language in such a way as to remind readers of cultural difference. It includes strategies such as using some foreign words from the original text and deliberately emphasizing the different and the innovative. As I just asked, if the antidote to domestication is foreignization, how do we move this concept from the realm of translation to everyday working life? The answer is behavioral. It comes from people who take the condition of language difference for granted without judgment. What this looks like is plurilingual collaborative communication in which the quality of relationship with others is treated as equal to, perhaps even more valuable than, the speed of information transfer. This actually happens, but it's a quiet phenomena, unlike the attention gathering or attention getting drama of people's frustrations with the so-called language barrier. Which brings us back around to the interwoven double helical structuring of language with time. If our languaging with each other is unbiased, then the condition of language difference is merely a fact of communication that we accommodate through normal processes of asking and answering questions, paraphrasing to test our understanding, and being attentive to and curious about those hints of foreignization. Now, how is generative AI going to do that? Automated interpreting by AI is not interpreting in the human sense. It is incredibly fast next word prediction combined with a finite set of approved translations into some human languages. Neural machine translation is improving rapidly and provides new opportunities for workplace communication in the condition of language difference. Its greatest weakness, though, is that it has no agency for collaboration within the condition of language difference. 
This will need to be designed into applications as part of the human computer interface. And humans will need to be trained to recognize when to distrust the integrity of its output. And we might want to do something about bias and the drastic disparity of access across the spectrum of human languages. So, do you have an answer to the prompt? Do you remember? Are language sensitive researchers related to the language industry? Here's what I think. Everything we say and do inclines toward a chronotope. As language sensitive researchers, your acts and discourse matters a great deal. You have a unique position within the political economy of business. Coming soon is official guidance from the Interpreting Safe AI Task Force, working in conjunction with an independent advisory group on AI and sign language interpreting. We're in the last round of feedback with the goal to publish in June. Also available are voluntary standards from the ISO, NIST, and ASTM, along with general regulations on AI from the EU and the US. Thank you for your attention.